Hi, everybody. Welcome to St. Louis County Library's virtual program, How to Plan Your Backyard Garden. My name is Melissa Bauer. I'm the Assistant Manager of, St. Louis, of Adult Services at St. Louis County Library. Before we get started, I just wanted to bring to your attention a few functions of Zoom in case this is your first virtual program. First of all, this is a webinar, which means you should be able to see and hear us, but we cannot see or hear you. You will have plenty of opportunity to ask questions in the chat box at the end of the program. So we'll ask that you hold your questions until then. I'll let everybody know when we're ready to um, accept those questions and then we'll go over them at the end of the presentation. At this time, if you're having a hard time hearing me, you'll wanna turn the volume up on your own device. And if at any point during the program, you have any connectivity issues, we'll just ask that you log out, move closer to your Wi-Fi router, and then log right back on in. We are recording this. And it'll be available on the St. Louis County Library's YouTube page within a couple of business days. But of course, we will send um, a link out to everyone who registered um, to your email that you registered for this program with. So you'll get expect that in your inbox in just a little while. Um, that will also have closed captions available. Um, we have a ton of gardening programs coming up. So I'm going to put a link in the chat box um, so you can register for more classes. We have everything from, um, you know, more things about vegetable gardens to native gardens, flower gardens, gardening for birds and bees and butterflies, you name it, spring is the time when we start presenting gardening programs. So they are coming, um, you have a lot to choose from, so don't forget to click that link I'm going to drop here in just a minute. Just as a reminder, you do not need to have a library card to come to St. Louis County Library programs. So if there's someone that you think would be interested in attending a future program with you, send them the link to register and have them meet you here. Because um, all, are, all are welcome all the time at any of our programs, both in person and um, virtually. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our instructor, Jackson Hambrick with Seed St. Louis. Um, he is the director of projects. Um, since 1984, Seed St. Louis has connected people to the land, their food, and each other. They are a local nonprofit that supports a network of over 250 community gardens. So Jackson is the expert in the subject of planning and implementing a vegetable garden for sure. We are very lucky that he's with us here today. So with that, Jackson, I will let you take it from here and I will see everybody at the end for our question and answer session. Thanks. Awesome, thank you, Melissa. And thank you all for coming. Um, I guess expert, it just, there's always more to learn. So I feel <laughs> hearing that, but um, I'm super excited. I really like this class. Um, we're gonna be talking about kind of planning, thinking about the garden. We'll dive into a little bit, I think, about some more specific spring stuff, just because we're in spring. So we should talk about it because that's the time of the year. Um, and then we'll have hopefully a good amount of time for some questions, because I know at this time of the year, there's lots of kind of questions. So when they open the chat back up, it can be about the, the presentation. It could also just be about other kind of gardening things in general. So, so kind of, yeah, what we're gonna talk about first, we're just gonna talk about laying out the garden. So this will be definitely more for people that are just starting to build a site. We'll talk about kind of what you go through, what to think about, and things like that. Well then, jump into once your kind of garden area is already set up, kind of talk about some planning for multiple seasons, what we do at Seed St. Louis to give some examples, um, and then some other examples from folks that I know. We'll talk about healthy soil, because that is extremely important for planning and just growing in general. Um, so building that healthy soil. Um, we'll talk a little bit about site prep for the spring um, and some best recommended practices. We'll have time to do a little bit about spring timing and just kind of using planting calendars, stuff like that for planning. And then I think we have enough time to talk a little bit about kind of starting early and then with kind of the cold weather coming in um, tomorrow, I guess, right? Um, talk a little bit about um, some techniques for extending the season starting early, stuff like that. So we will just dive right in. Also, I don't think we mentioned, but so I work for Seed St. Louis, um, we are formerly Gateway Greening, so if you're like, who the heck is Seed St. Louis? I don't really know who they are. Um, we changed our name from Gateway Greening last fall, so if you know Gateway Greening, it's just us. So, um, so first, just a little bit before we go into kind of the tips and techniques for planning. Usually we get this kind of question a lot of, 
if I'm in my backyard, should I be separating my ornamentals and edibles? Um, it's just kind of one of those things we all think about just kind of doing where keep our flowering stuff away, or maybe my ornamental tree, we don't need to be planting any edibles around them. But really there isn't kind of a main, there isn't really a main reason for separating these. Um, if you are doing kind of like maybe you have something that requires as a pest problem where you're doing kind of some heavy pesticide spray on it, then yeah, we probably wanna keep those edibles away from that ornamental, but most people don't. So really there isn't a main reason to segregate our edibles from our ornamentals. And most often we'll talk a little bit about kind of benefits of blending these together, but usually our ornamentals are things that we find pretty. So flowering plants, stuff that's good for pollinators, stuff like that. And these are really great for our edibles as well. Um, not only is bringing in increasing pollination, but also helping reduce pest pressure. So um, if you're not, if you're like, kind of like, you didn't really think about it, blending these together is a really great way. Um, the only thing is a lot of our ornamentals are perennials. And if we're going to be mostly talking about annual plants. So um, when we're pairing our edibles with those perennial ornamentals. Um, we just have to be a little careful on what kind of plants we're doing. So if we're doing stuff that's in the ground, maybe like carrots and radishes and turnips, not a big deal. They're not really gonna be disturbing much of the root system of these perennial ornamentals, but of those kind of like maybe potatoes, sweet potatoes, things that require like some heavy digging to get out, we might wanna keep those a little farther away from some of those ornamentals. Um, and then also just a point of like some of these, a lot of these ornamentals that we don't consider edible um, are edible in other countries or other cultures. So, um, or just like an example of like tomatoes for a few hundred years when they made it to Europe were grown as ornamental plants. And they, a lot of Europeans, since they're in the nightshade family, thought they weren't edible, but they grew them as ornamentals, which I love growing tomatoes, but they're a lot of work to even get tomatoes, let alone make them look pretty. So I was kind of blown away still at always thinking of people growing tomato plants just because they look pretty and trying to make them pretty is really funny to me. So, but so kind of getting past that. So first step, if you're just kind of starting new, maybe you've moved into a new place or you're really trying to start a new garden, um, what you should first do is kind of just first making a map. And we're gonna kind of walk through those steps of kind of making a map. It doesn't need to be super pretty. You don't need to be super accurate. You don't need to like figure out all like the topography of your space, but there are some key things that you wanna think about when you're thinking about design. Um, so first, whenever you do your, you can do this on an eight by 11 piece of paper. That's usually what I've done in spaces uh, whenever we're working with a new garden. You can also use Excel as a really nice, simple way to kind of make shapes. You basically just make, you're familiar at all with Excel, you know, the cells in Excel are rectangles. You basically just make them squares um, and then just kind of figure out yourself what your size of a square is. If you have a pretty small yard, you could probably do a square as a foot. Um, or if you have a pretty big yard, maybe a square as a yard. So something to think about. But once you've kind of figured out how you're gonna make your map, what kind of format, um, you want to first put out those permanent features. So you'll need measuring tape or something. Um, you can actually use Google Maps pretty well for this too. Um, but put those things on that map that aren't going away. So that's if it's your backyard or your front yard, your house, if you have any driveways or any hard concretes, maybe some sidewalks, if you have a garage or some type of outbuilding, um, fencing, also, and then any established trees or plants you don't want to remove. So putting these in, and this is where you need to be measuring between these things. So again, it doesn't have to be perfect. We give ourselves some wiggle room as we're making these, but it is good to know like my garage, if you're in like a classic like South City um, house where you have maybe like a, a garage or a carport behind your house, you've got maybe what, 30 yards between your your deck and that. So it's good to have roughly that versus being like, oh, is it 10? Is it 40? Getting kind of roughly there. So, um, and then it's always good if we're going to be doing any digging, we're going to mostly talk about annual vegetables, but if you're looking at putting in any fruit trees or any other perennials, getting those utilities marked. It's free. You can call. We have all the ads about calling before you dig. Do that. Um, they're usually pretty quick. 
So once we've kind of done our permanent spaces, this is a nice, really fancy design. You don't have to do anything like that. Um, when it want to add kind of maybe some walking paths or seating pads, seating areas, these don't have to be there yet. But if you're using your this space, not only for gardening first, or even if you're just using it fully for gardening, how are you going to get to these places? So think about where your walking path is going to be. If you're going to want to sit in your garden, which if you're going to grow a garden, I think enjoying it while sitting around it is a great way. Um, so just, you don't have to have these permanent made. You can even just do kind of a circle. That's usually what I do when I do our rough gardens um, is I just kind of, for new spaces, I'll just like kind of draw a circle being like, all right, this is probably where some picnic tables are gonna be, seating areas. So we know we're not gonna be putting any raised beds or any in-ground planting there. Um, lawn areas, kind of designating that. If you're gonna keep grass in this area, um, really designating that space is good because um, this will help kind of with your spacing, thinking about mowing, stuff like that. Um, and then those planting beds. So if you already have some, but if you're gonna put some physical planting beds, put that in there as well. Again, like I mentioned, don't forget, we have to, you have to be able to get to these areas and not just yourself. So like maybe you might need a wheelbarrow to get over there, or you might be carrying a couple of things of shovels or a tub. So give yourself a little bit of space while doing this, when you're doing your design. And so usually at that point, you're pretty good. You can like walk away, do your kind of design and you're, and you're got 90%, you'll be pretty effective. Um, you can add another step. And definitely if you're looking at putting more permanent perennial stuff that we're not gonna talk about today, but if you're doing design, it's something to think about, you probably should add a couple other things in there. So soil conditions is a good thing to think about and really good ways to know this is really look at where, if you have any pooling water in your property, is it sunken down, is it a high area? So putting that will help give you some topography, but also good soil conditions. If your water is pooling an area and you're like, oh, well, this is where my garden's gonna go. Gotta think about how we're gonna move that water away from there because we don't want pooling water where we're gonna be growing plants. Um, is the area kind of rocky? Did some gravel get moved in? If you've kind of graded spaces, maybe sometimes there's kind of the heavy areas kind of heavier clay. That also, the soil conditions will really help you think about, which we're going to talk about in a bit, about design, raised beds, in-ground planting, stuff like that. Um, and then the most important thing, so after of like not physically where, I guess the second most important thing. So first more most important is you can't put a garden bed where there's a house or things like that, but sunlight is the next one. That is usually like the biggest limiting factor for our gardening is our plants getting enough sun. Um, so this is a really, the best way to do this outside of just looking at, I mean, like just seeing where your tree is, is just pay attention. If you are at home on a weekend day or something, look at if you have a tree and you're like, yeah, this might be blocking some sun or you're maybe on the north side of your property and you're like, eh, I don't know where the sun hits on and onto my land, onto my property is just go out at like eight, nine in the morning, look at where the shade is when the sun's rising, look around midday. And then again, look around when the sun is setting, seeing where that shading is coming from um, will really help you give a good gauge. Um, I really like this image right here, but so for us in Missouri and really Northern hemisphere, we're gonna, you want good Southern sun. So if we look at this kind of house, we have this nice difference between the winter and summer sunsets. Um, so during the summer, we got the sun's just directly above us. We're pretty good. We can get kind of sunlight everywhere. Um, so if you're on the north side of something, usually you can be growing a lot of stuff. But that southern side, this is where we're trying to put most of our garden, is that southern sun. So we're getting plenty of winter sun, but maybe some spring and fall as well. But we're getting lots of sunlight. Um, if we can't, if you can't find any good southern sun, I used to live in an apartment where I had no good southern sun, the northern side was all I could do. It just means you have to plant a little differently. You can't plant as early because there's not much sunlight. Um, maybe a lot of these like fruiting summer plants that need a lot of sunlight, you might not be able to grow as much, but you could also look at it as kind of like embracing Maybe this area is a lot cooler during the summer, so I can grow some more cool season plants. Maybe my kale and collards can stay nice and good looking through the summer. 
Um, so but sunlight, southern sun is what we want. Um, and so like, if you can do anything with your design, that is like one of the most important things. So, and so kind of once you've figured all this out, you've got your base map. This is what we've got. And it'll really determine kind of what you have to work with for planting. Um, doesn't need to be super pretty. If you've noticed, I've had some different images of kind of some nice, really nice looking ones designed on a computer. I probably should even add the one that I do a lot with Excel where it's just kind of some squares. Um, it's just like, it doesn't need to be great. It's really, it's for your reference. It helps out. Also, I don't think I mentioned in there, but it kind of makes sense is label everything you put on there. Um, definitely with um, not just like tree, but if you can figure out what type of tree, super helpful for yourself in like three or four years when you're like, I can't remember what kind of tree that was. Or if you sell your house or you move, the person that moves in, they would probably love to know. So it's super helpful. So you've got your base map, you figure it out. And you're like, okay, I've got some good Southern sun in this space. Um, now, what am I gonna do? What kind of plants am I gonna put in? How am I gonna grow this stuff? Um, so there are a couple ways. And again, we're talking mostly, we're gonna be talking about annual vegetables with tons of other ways to do kind of structures in the garden, but we only have so much time in the class. So we're gonna kind of focus on a couple. Um, so you can do raised bed gardening. That's probably what most people think about with their vegetable gardens. So using standard, just kind of some wood, putting stuff together holds in the soil that we grow in. But depending on where you are, you could also do some in-ground planting. I can talk about some pros and cons of each of these. Um, you can kind of do this like halfway in between measure where it's kind of like a berm or so. Um, so we're bringing in soil to physically lift it up and that's where we're planting, but we don't have this kind of structure holding in the soil. Um, or maybe you're like, I pretty much my deck it's the only place that I get a good amount of sun. And so we have some containers that you could probably do as well. Um, and if you're doing any containers, we're not gonna talk a ton about it today just because there's so much to talk about. We have classes on container gardening. I think there's a couple on our on our YouTube page um, that you can find some pre-recorded. There's a lot of great info out there. So some notes about raised beds. So the one thing with raised beds and um, our berms is we're bringing in soil, which is nice. So it means, We'll talk about building some healthy soil, but it means we're kind of starting from scratch. This is really great. It's a little pricier, obviously, than planting in ground, um, but we do get a lot of extra benefits. The soil is gonna be more nutritious because if you're buying it from St. Louis Composting or from like Lowe's or Home Depot, you can buy stuff that has compost already mixed in. Um, it's already not gonna be super compacted, which is great. That's the one problem with planting in ground um, is compaction is a concern. Um, but when you're putting these in, usually just some good tips, things I've found as we've been building gardens is, um, I wouldn't go much wider than four feet on a raised bed or really, and if you can get all the way around it, any wider than four feet, it's pretty tough to reach the middle of a garden bed. And then if it's taller, so this is a bed that looks like it's about two feet tall. Um, usually we do a standard 10 inch wide board, um, and that's good enough. Um, but if you go even taller, two boards on top of each other, then, um, you might even want to go a little less than four feet. But if you go to five feet, six feet wide, you're really kind of losing, you're wasting space in the middle. You can't reach it that well. I'm reasonably tall and it's still tough to reach a middle of a five foot bed. So I wouldn't go. And then for length, if you're doing standard board, like if you're doing like a wooden board, um, I wouldn't go much longer than a 12 foot board. Um, you can make the beds longer, but I would buy them in beds and boards of 12 feet and then do some type of support in the middle of at least every 12 feet. Or the pressure of that soil pushing out will bend those boards. It'll increase kind of the rotting with that bend. Um, and it'll just kind of, nobody likes how their beds look when they're kind of bend bending. Um, so really I find any longer than 12 feet, you really start to get a lot more pressure, really starts to bend the boards. So, um, and then when you're first installing those beds, overfill them and mound the soil. I don't know why I said found, but mound them because the soil is going to settle. Anytime you're doing kind of this new stuff, expect the soil to settle. The more compost that you're putting in versus soil, the more it will settle as well. So if you're like, oh, I've got a ton of compost, throwing it in there, expect a lot more settling through the season. Um, than the soil, so which is fine. That's 
not like a problem. It just means you have to be prepared the following year to add some more compost or soil or something like that. So for any of these, this is also putting cardboard in the bottom. This is the same kind of with these berms as well. We're really trying to like create a barrier because most people are putting these on top of yards with grass. But even if you're not, it's still recommended to put some cardboard on the bottom. You could also do like a weed fabric or something like that. But the one benefit with cardboard below the bed of your raised bed or your berm is it'll eventually break down. So first we're putting that cardboard down to kind of create a weed barrier. So we put cardboard below this raised bed so that the grass doesn't just grow through um, and take over our bed. So we're trying to help ourselves out in the future for less weeding. Um, but then that cardboard after a couple of years will really like about a year, year and a half, it'll like fully rot. Um, so then first we're having things break down, which is nice that plastic and the um, weed fabric won't really break down. And when it does, it turns into microplastics while our cardboard gets broken down by microorganisms, which is great. Um, it also will then allow, it'll have been there long enough to where most of the grass in there will have been killed. So you have a lot less weeds you have to worry about. So, and then when, in, when using any of these, if you're using wood, really you should be using rot resistant. So you can buy natural, you can buy cedar, which is a common one. Douglas fir is a little cheaper. Um, which also has similar like to cedar, rat resistance, or you can do a treated pine. So that's what we do at Seed St. Louis. I'd love to be able to buy cedar boards, but they're too expensive for us for the amount that we support. So we use a copper treated pine. It basically is a fungicide treatment they put on there. It reduces the, the it slows down the rotting process in the board. Um, those treatments don't leach into the soil, um, which is a common question people have. Um, also it's copper. The previous treatments used to be arsenic. The whole industry has pretty much moved away from it. Um, so it's the boards that you would buy at Lowe's or Home Depot or any kind of local lumber place. They've pretty much all switched to a copper fungicide treatment. So, or you can use another material. You don't have to use wood. Wood looks nice. It's kind of what we think about, but using pavers, cement, like cement blocks. I mean, there's just tons of things you can do. So you don't have to be just stuck sticking in with just that. And so just a little about design, I always wanna make a mention about animal pests and I bet we'll have some questions about them. So it's good to think about pests in the area. I bet most of us would probably be dealing with deer, rabbits and squirrels. Um, I wish I had some great solution for the three of these of dealing with them, um, but there really aren't. Um, the best I have seen from gardens, first for deer is really just keeping the deer out. So. I know we have a couple of school gardens that will basically line up next to some forests. So they have deer kind of walking through their parking lot, stuff like that. And they, after a couple of years, decide to spend the money and actually put in a deer fence. <laughs> um, they're a little, it, I think it was a brand that like it's actually meant for keeping deer out. Um, it wasn't super cheap and I bet it wouldn't be cheap now with kind of all the supply stuff, but um, it has worked. Um, for rabbits, um, we've found it pretty effective putting kind of chicken wire around the edges. If it's a raised bed, you can attach kind of a taller, you can just screw in a board like a one by one or something to kind of a couple different points around your raised bed, wrap it around. It's a little annoying to get into the bed, but it does help kind of keep some rabbits out. It's not perfect, but it's a decent solution. And then squirrels are just tough because usually it's tomatoes sometimes peppers or squash, but usually tomatoes is what squirrels are going after. Um, I know some people recommend putting out water to keep the squirrels because they're thirsty. I found that doesn't work. They still just take a bite of my tomato and throw it in the yard. Um, you can fully enclose your tomatoes. We have at our demonstration garden, a nice, I think four foot by four foot cube that's fully wrapped in chicken wire and we can stick it on top of tomatoes and. Squirrels can't get in. It does mean you have to figure out how you're going to get in and definitely with tomatoes, kind of pruning, doing all that. But that is a solution. Um, cherry tomatoes is sometimes a good alternative. They don't eat them all. Um, I'm trying this year. So we didn't have many squirrels in my garden, which is really great until the end of the year. So I'm trying this year where right now I'm putting out some old Christmas ornaments on the fencing around the garden because we have it fenced around. Um, that look kind of red, hopefully, I don't know, I'm just kind of saying maybe the squirrels will think 
but they're tomatoes, they'll like try to bite them, they'll be like, eh, this isn't that good. And they might just kind of be like, okay, maybe this whole space is like that. So something I'm trying, I'll report back at the end of the year um, and update the presentation to talk about it. So um, this is definitely where once we get to the questions that people have recommendations, I always love to hear them to see what has worked, what hasn't. I found any kind of sprays or anything doesn't really work. Deer resistant plants, usually they're ornamentals anyways, I've also heard aren't really that deer resistant, so. Okay, so a little, and I wanted to talk a little bit about some benefits of structures before we dive into kind of in-season planning. Um, if you are growing in ground, um, it is just good to know if you're brand new to doing it in the space, um, to get an idea of what your soil looks like, um, so kind of digging it up. We'll talk a little about building soil health in a second, but um, it is in most of St. Louis, if you're in St. Louis City or in parts of St. Louis County and North County and kind of deep parts of South County, um, we do have quite a bit of soil contamination with a lot of lead and heavy metals. Um, so if you're growing in the ground, I'd recommend getting a soil test, the University of Missouri Extension Office. You can go to their website. They'll tell you how to do it. Basically, dig up a little bit of your soil, put it in a little baggie and send it to them. They can do heavy metal tests, they can do nutrient loads, all this stuff. But the heavy metal test is pretty important. And if you do find you have a decent amount of heavy metals and lead, I would recommend doing raised beds or bringing in your own soil. Um, because plants do uptake a little bit, not a ton. If you bring in your own beds, you're pretty much eliminating that problem. But then also you're not interacting with that soil. And that's a big concern is, digging up in that soil, getting dirt on your hands, not fully washing them. If you have kids, that's a concern. Um, so doing that lead testing is really important. Um, also in ground, while it is cheaper, it's nice. You can really help build up that soil. If you do a lot of our soils here, either have a lot of clay, we have some heavy compaction, that stuff, that's tough as, that stuff is pretty tough to deal with. Um, you can put a lot of effort in, feel like you're adding a lot of um, nutrients to it, a lot more like kind of loosening it up and you'll find after a couple of years, it kind of reverts back to what it was. So that's again, kind of where at some places I really recommend people doing, bringing in soil, whether a raised bed or doing some berms, stuff like that. So. All right, and so we've kind of, we've got our beds put together, we have all that. So we're gonna kind of think about what we wanna grow. And so this is just recommendations on kind of how I think about it. Some of us at Seed St. Louis do, when we're planning our gardens. Um, this is the time of the year, though, a little late now, but if you're about a month or two ago, this is the time to be kind of looking through those seed catalogs because there's kind of some seed shortages, so you might not be able to get the seeds you want. Um, but think about what we want to grow this year, just kind of creating that big list. What I like to do is kind of the stuff I really want to grow. So there's a couple of peppers I really love growing every year, kind of some other things I would like to grow if there's space, and then just kind of some other things that I'm like, eh, it'd be nice to have, but I can buy it at the farmer's market or grocery store. So, and then kind of once I've created that list, what I like to do before I'm placing my stuff in the beds or like kind of doing the design, I think about what of my really ones I want to grow, what are those big kind of long-term plants? And that's kind of how I think about it. So those kale, the collards, um, our eggplant, okra, peppers, potatoes, pumpkins, things that take a lot of space. And then kind of once I've kind of made that list of those, I think about kind of what other things are we talking about? Like are these plants gonna be vining, are they taking over? Um, what is their, what do they look like and act like in that space? And so once I've kind of created that list of those big ones, are kind of quick growing smaller plants, our carrots, quickish growing, but they don't take a lot of space. Our beets, our lettuces, um, maybe our little bits of our, like onion sets or scallions, peas, radishes, kind of these smaller plants we can kind of stick in other places. We don't really need to plant a whole garden bed unless you really love some beets or lettuce. You don't need to plant the whole garden bed about like, this is where all the lettuce is going. Instead, maybe you're like, well, we're gonna grow tomatoes in this bed. So I know late April, early May, I need space for my tomatoes. So I'm gonna put that in kind of my map. And then I'm gonna be like, okay, well, I want some lettuce in here. So I gotta put some lettuce on the side so it's not in the way of those tomato seedlings coming in. Um, or maybe I want some kind of onions around it. So I'm gonna put some onions around it. 
So these are kind of the things to think about. And so then once we've kind of made our list, we've kind of categorized them into those big plants growing for the whole season, the small plants that are kind of quick growing, thinking about our space and our garden bed. So I'm, I'm not a huge proponent of kind of like the uh, pairing of plants because they like do well together. There's not a ton of research with kind of stuff like that, but I do love pairing plants and I find super effective based kind of like on size and timing is really important. Kind of what those nutrient needs are and kind of the timing of those seasons. So this picture right here is really nice. This is um, some squash, it's a winter squash growing on top of this bed. This is a picture in probably late summer, early fall. Um, and then underneath it, we have some beets planted. So they're getting that nice shading in the fall, pretty hot. It's hard to plant some cool season plants. So we're using one of the plants we're already growing to provide some shading for it. If we didn't have this, the squash would be all over the raised bed. We wouldn't have any space to plant any cool season plant. So kind of thinking about their vertical space as well and optimizing that space. So um, here's another good example of things to think about for pairings is so these are some berms we have. Um, so we do carrots on the side, or you could do any kind of root vegetable that's a cool season plant. Um, carrots work really nicely because they grow a long time. And then we have some pole beans planted in the middle. And so by the time these pole beans are getting big enough, our carrots are still in the ground. They're getting a little extra shade, which the carrots are a little cranky when it gets so hot early. So we're kind of helping out with these beans, providing a little bit of shade. The beans are off the ground. Um, so we don't have to worry about them kind of vining and getting everywhere. And that shading is really nice. So it's timing of those. Um, some other nice timings of things. So flowering herbs are really great as kind of a companion plant. Um, I really like doing um, lettuce as kind of like a salad mix. So instead of doing kind of heads of lettuce, kind of just doing like almost like a carpet of lettuce. And then I'll do like multiple successions of it, which I think we talk a little bit about some succession, but then planting tomatoes kind of in the middle. So pulling in like that seedling, it's late April. They still got lettuce in the ground. They're gonna grow for a couple more weeks. I'll just dig out a little spot, put that tomato plant in there. Um, and then it still has the lettuce growing around it. So it's kind of keeping the soil cooler, doing nice, but the tomato still has, it's taller than the lettuce. So it's not like it's being shaded, but some other kind of nice pairings Throwing in like some sage in there, you know, your marigolds, milkweed, of course. Um, but there's some like, you know, those other edibles, definitely in herbs are really nice to just kind of throw into the corners of beds or the ends of maybe your berm or your in-ground planting, or even just using some of these plants as kind of more a treating, thinking of it as like an ornamental that you just also happen to get some stuff from. So um, the house I'm in, big yard on the south side, the north side. Put some, we put some chives out front in the north. We do some other kind of herbs as well. Um, we don't put mint out there. And if you haven't grown mint, it is very aggressive and it likes to take over. So if you're gonna, like, if you love mint, that's great. Plant it somewhere where you're fine if it takes over the space or put it in a container. Um, other good pairings also. Um, so most of the research with companion plants and things like that, um, plants in the allium family, so your onions, your chives, your garlic, stuff like that, um, have been shown to kind of repel or just reduce the populations of kind of our aphids and white flies. And so pairing those with plants that have some of that pest pressure, so our cabbage, our kale, collards. Um, so putting, so like this picture right here, we got some collards right down the middle, and then we have a row of onions on each side. The nice thing with also those alliums, those onions, is they don't need a ton of space. They're pretty like Brazilian on kind of just planting and doing whatever. So you can kind of just be like, all right, I'm gonna put these onions kind of on the outside of a bed or a berm, or just kind of sticking them wherever, they'll be fine. And at worst, maybe they're a little too crowded and they don't get fully big. Yeah, you pull it out early and you got a little bit of a smaller onion, which is not a bad deal. Uh, but there's plenty of other pairings you can find tons of them, but thinking about kind of that size. So when is this plant where? We'll talk a little bit, I think, and we have a little thing about our um, planting calendar, talk about time. So I mentioned a little bit about succession planting. Um, so this is succession planting is basically planting seeds, usually, 
in intervals of kind of seven, 21 days, depending on the plant. So you can kind of spread out your harvest through a season. So it works really great with like lettuce or really quick growing plants. You'll see like some huge benefit. So um, whether you do it with where you're thinking of maybe heads of lettuce or you're doing it with maybe like this where it's like a salad mix. So you plant one set in like an area and then like a week later you plant it in another set and then a week later. And so you're kind of having this all mature instead of it all maturing at once if you plant it all at once and you're like, well, I'm only eating salads for lunch and dinner for the foreseeable future. And then you're like, and then you're like done um, once they're all done. Instead of doing that, you do the succession. So you're like, eh, just a salad for lunch. And that's all I need for the next couple of months. Um, you can also do this. So you can plant this with kind of the same plant, or you can actually get a little more fun and creative and look at different plant varieties with different days to maturity. Um, lettuce, there isn't a huge range, but with radishes and turnips, you'll see like a pretty significant range. And those are also two ones that work really well. So you can find some radishes where it's like 28 days to maturity. And then you can find some that are like at 40. And if you planted those both at the same time, you're pulling them out, you're pulling them out at different times too. So uh, works great with root vegetables, lettuces, um, Johnny's seeds. Um, so I think we're, we'll probably send out the presentation so you can click this link. You can also just Google Johnny seeds succession planting. They have a really great chart on showing what plants and kind of the timing, because it does depend um, on the days to maturity in the plant of how many days you do between. So something to think about. And so then we're kind of, you're doing all this planning, you're thinking about like, all right, I'm gonna be growing my kale, my tomatoes over here. Um, and kind of I've figured out that. And then I'm like, all right, I'm gonna put my onions around this. I'm gonna do this. And then you're like, oh, and then Jackson mentioned something about rotations. And I was like, now I have to think about all this stuff and this rotation. And it's like, but now I have also, You've, you're like looking at this and you're like, well, I don't just plant a whole bed of tomatoes. Also Jackson just said to mix up things together. So like, how does this rotation like work if you're doing that? Um, so this is definitely an ideal. So like, this is a four year rotation. I just put it on here because it's a really nice picture. It explains things really well. I don't expect most gardeners to be doing four year rotations. I don't do it at home. Um, usually I do a two to three and I kind of like flip flopping kind of rotation. Um, and usually what I do since we're mixing things together. So first, I guess I should back up. The whole point of doing kind of a plant, like a, a rotation is um, a lot of the, first there's a couple of pest pressure and nutrients are usually the number two, one and two. Um, so the reason we rotate our plants every year um, is because some of our pests will like live in the soil after the year is done and they'll emerge back out of that soil. And so if you're growing tomatoes and you keep growing tomatoes in the same spot year after year after year, you're building up the amount of pests that are living in that soil or coming back to that space. And so if you move it every year, you can reduce the amount of pests that are in there. It really is important on kind of the soil borne pests. So if you have like tomatoes and you have like some tomato blight, that's usually from the soil. So rotating those every year is good. If you just have one raised bed, it's kind of like moving them in a raised bed, you'll get some benefit, but it's not the most. So it's just kind of something where it's like, this is nice to do, it's not always possible. But when you are doing your rotation, it's really good if you're doing your interplanting like we were talking about, is to prioritize in kind of this order, prioritize those fruiting plants. So those kind of summer plants we all think about. So those cucumbers, those tomatoes, those squash, those eggplants, peppers. Um, and that's because they have a lot of pest pressure. That's really the reason. They also pull a lot of nutrients, but the pests is kind of the big thing. So like our squash, you know, vine borers that can overwinter in the soil. So those are like, if we had a problem with vine borers the year before, probably should be planting these somewhere else. Um, and then kind of the next one after that are leafing plants, really like our collards and cabbage, because they have a lot of, they have a decent amount of pest pressure. So kind of moving those around and then kind of the last bit, kind of those root crops or those legumes kind of inner in between on those two. Some people have some real problems growing um, some beans. They have some bean beetle problems and stuff. So I'd say maybe legumes would be a little higher than root, root plants. Some people have some problems with kind of some onion stuff. And so you'd prioritize those. So um, there's tons of different types of rotations. 
they, there's more complicated ones that break it down by families. Um, but I really like this one because it's pretty simple, makes sense. Um, but it's something to also be thinking about. So when we're kind of drawing out our plan, I think I have a little drawing out that plan. So we have that base map. Maybe we're doing this on the base map that we made earlier. Maybe the base map's kind of a very big zoomed out picture. And then we do kind of some squares in Excel for our raised bed or something. Um, so doing that, just kind of putting things in there um, is nice. This one, this little map, this picture right here does some nice stuff where they're kind of doing some color coordinating between the varieties. Um, or you can do something like this. So this is the one that we use. Um, and we kind of color coordinate based on like how long stuff is going to be on the ground. This is gets really super complicated with like kind of doing planning for rotations. This is probably a little more, a little more than you really need to do in a backyard. Um, but it is good to think about with timing of kind of where your rotation, kind of how this one goes is basically like we look at the previous year, we kind of write down for the next year what kind of following this rotation. So we were like, oh, there are some fruiting plants in there in this bed of 10 or tomatoes. So we could do these type of plants. So we kind of do that whole projection for the next year. And then we start sticking stuff in using that projection. So there's a lot of other ways to do it. We could do a whole class on rotations. So we don't have enough time for it, but um, definitely think about doing some rotations. It doesn't need to be that complicated though. Um, and then, so we've kind of got our plan, we got all that, the beds ready to go, or maybe we're kind of starting from last year. So we need to think about how are we, how are we treating our soil or what are we doing? So improving soil, definitely very important. Like we talked earlier, we're growing in ground, or we raise beds. Um, if you're in ground, drainage, soil contamination and nutrients are important to think about. We talked a bit about this. Um, if we're in our raised beds, we can influence all three of these much more. Raised beds or berms drain much faster, which is good and bad. Um, we're bringing in soil, so we don't have to worry too much about soil contamination. Um, and then we're also bringing in soil, so we don't have to worry too much about nutrients. Um, it is more expensive in ground planting, just growing in the ground, um, but it is usually you can do a lot better. But so we're improving our soil. So what do we kind of need to think about when we're doing our soil improvement? Is basically the food and the, we want soil life basically in there. We want some nice activity. That is really like the best way to increase fertility in soil is having living organisms in it. So microorganisms, roots from plants, stuff like that. Um, and so food for these microorganisms pretty much comes from two sources. It comes from the plants actively growing in their roots, the um, nutrients and things that they basically drop off of those roots, those interactions between those organisms, and then organic matter. So if you see, you hear about organic matter with soil, you don't need to be too worried about it, but usually around 3%, pretty much if you're buying any soil from any store, bagged in a giant truck being dropped off, you don't need to worry about it, it'll be enough. Um, soil life needs oxygen, just like us. And so what this is, this is where that's standing water is really important to avoid. We don't want standing water um, because that water sits on there. If you can see the standing water, it means there's also water in the soil below it. So we're, it's soil's losing oxygen and you're killing off the life in there. We want that soil to be well draining because the plants need water, all the organisms in there need water, but it doesn't want to sit there. Um, and then also we do want to minimize compaction. You know, we kind of all naturally think of good soil. We kind of pick it up in our hand, it's nice and fluffy. Yeah, that's minimized, that's no compaction. There's lots of oxygen in there, which is promoting a lot of growth. And then we also do need soil life to be present. So one of the things is when we're buying soil, um, when we're buying any of our soil, often it's basically like they call it kind of like fully cooked. So they've heated it up enough to really kind of try to kill all those weed seeds in the soil, which is good because it means we're not planting some weeds in our garden bed. Um, but it does mean that we don't have many microorganisms in there. So we do have to either kind of promote it with adding a little bit of maybe soil from our garden or just kind of expecting it to take a little bit longer to get started with growing. So if you're starting fresh, usually I tell groups or people the first year, you might not get as much growth as you will the second year because that soil was, it's, there's a lot of stuff going on. It's 
you know, we put that soil in there, it's gonna kind of fall down and compress a little bit. It doesn't have as much uh, microorganism activity in it. It's been tossed around, so it takes a little bit for that soil life to build up. So I um, wanna make sure we have enough time. So I realized I didn't have a clock anywhere, so I just grabbed my phone. Um, so how do we do that? We need to make sure we break up compaction. If it is pretty compacted, if you're growing in the ground, this is something important to do. You can do your standard tilling, though it is found usually when you start tilling, the compaction, yes, it gets nice and loose, but then actually it compacts even more the following year. So um, sometimes it's just kind of necessary. You have to start with some tillage, um, but usually a broad fork, which is a good example right here, just kind of loosening the soil is really good. Plants also will just naturally break up this compaction. So you're growing things in there, those roots will get in there, they'll break it up. You can be more specific using cover crops. So you can use some like tillage radishes, which in general, it's pretty much just a radish. You're just treating it like a tillage radish where you just like let it die in there. The, the roots break it up. Um, you do need to basically add organic matter. Usually throughout the year, we'll be adding organic matter um, or at the beginning of the year. So often, and what we do is we'll add a couple inches of compost on top of a bed every spring. Um, and usually we'll use a broad fork first, just kind of loosen up the soil and then we'll drop the compost in there. So it falls into those cracks. We get some nice nutrients throughout the soil. Um, and then kind of feeding that good fungus. So we're talking about those organisms. Um, so for those perennial crops, so those trees, fruit trees, stuff like that. This is why one of the recommendations why people tell you to put wood chips on there. Um, it helps support fungal populations. Just keeping things alive will also do that. But then also mulching kind of through the year with leaf mulch or compost also will help. And so I know we're kind of running quick on time, so I might have to jump quickly, but just kind of kind of requirements are just kind of what you see for good soil. Um, that 70% cocoa color, I like the image right there, some good soil indicators, kind of smells like if you can imagine in your, just think about what like an old growth forest soil kind of smells where it's, you know, it's kind of like musky with like kind of some of that, like you can kind of almost tell that there's some type of fungus in there. Um, rich kind of well-draining soils, visible airways. Yeah, it looks a little bit more like a kind of a chocolate cake. So, so. Um, and so a little bit about layout, I think. Um, for spring timing, so if you had so many cover crops in there, usually you have to kind of kill before cover crops set. Um, if you are doing any spring planting and you have cover crops in the ground, often you're gonna have to kind of kill it. Um, but um, that can either be kind of through taking a shovel or a fork, flipping it over, chopping it up. Um, usually you do this a couple of weeks before you're planting. You don't want to do this like 10 minutes before you're planting because it'll take some time for these to break down and die. Um, so um, I do want to make sure we have plenty of time for questions. So I want to quickly go through some um, layout. So if you are doing, we talked a little bit about layout earlier. You've got your soil ready to go and you're gonna do some planting. Um, I do recommend trying to think about using those plants as kind of using the size of these plants to help you. So in the spring, our spring plants, so what we're planting pretty much right now through the next month or month and a half is sunlight is actually, sunlight and temperature are gonna be our limiting factors. And so we want as much sunlight for these spring crops as possible. So um, usually you plant, if this is kind of a big raised bed, this brown thing, we'll plant our cool season crops on the Southern side of a raised bed. Um, so they're getting plenty of sunlight and then plan if we're gonna do some other warm season stuff in the bed that's gonna be in there long-term, maybe we'll plant it in the middle. Maybe it'll be tomatoes right down the middle of the bed. And so then when we get to fall, we're going to do, maybe we're like, oh yeah, I'm going to definitely do some lettuce for the fall. Though when you're planting your lettuce in the fall, it's usually 190 something degrees in August, usually you have to be planting. So we're trying to use this plant to not only help keep some soil cool, we're using some shading. So we plant our cool season plants on the north side. So just a good tip for that. So, um, a little bit about spring timing since we are in spring. So first, it's challenging. Missouri, we've got very unpredictable springs as we kind of know now with some good example this spring of like, we get 70 degrees, we get snow, stuff like that. Um, 
Our summers sometimes come very early, which can be a really big challenge for growing in the spring. Um, and so kind of how we adapt to our spring timing is looking at varieties that have some heat resistance or quick growing plants. Um, so short days to maturity compared to other varieties. So like our cabbages is a really good example, leaning more into those um, faster ones, using seedlings on sensitive or those slow growing plants. So instead of planting seeds of kale or collards or cabbage um, or heads let head lettuce outside, we instead plant seedlings um, because they'll get to full maturity before we hit summer. Um, or, and then another one is we can do some season extension. We can start season a little bit early with some covers. Um, so if you haven't seen our planting calendar, I highly recommend it. I think the library will have some of these some kind of some nice hard card stock that can get wet. You can bring out to the, out into the garden. Um, but we're basically right in the middle of planting, um, which is really exciting, even with the snow coming in. So I'm gonna kind of zoom through. Um, um, a little note, I talked a little bit about seedlings real quick, but um, probably the last thing we will talk about before I, we opened up kind of for questions is kind of people often ask about what plants to buy seeds of versus buying seedlings of. Because um, in general, you kind of want to lean yourself into buying seeds. You can get better varieties, more variety of different types of plants when you buy seeds. You can buy them online, you can get them shipped, stuff like that. Um, they're a lot cheaper. Usually you can buy a bag of like a seed packet. I have a range of 10 to 100 seeds or more for the same price as either one or maybe a four pack of seedlings. Um, so usually um, the reason that we plant seedlings then you're like, oh, well, why would I even do that? Is like I was mentioning earlier, those spring plants that take a long time to grow that are sensitive to heat. So that's kind of in this category of your broccoli, your cauliflower, your cabbage, your head lettuce, maybe your collards, maybe your kale, um, or maybe some of those summer plants you really just wanna get started early. Um, so those tomatoes, the eggplant, peppers, basil, people usually are in that kind of boat of where um, you wanna get them going, you wanna get them so you start them in early inside or you buy them and then you plant them outside real quick, like right when we can. Versus if you planted a seed, you'd be 30 days, 60 days, or depending on what you're growing, behind the ones that you've um, planted as seedlings. And so then for those direct seeding, it's really those plants where like, it doesn't really matter. Like they're pretty quick growing in the summer. So like that's your okra, your squash, your cucumbers. You can buy seedlings of these. I've seen them at stores, um, but they basically, until we kind of get really into summer, they don't really grow that much. So um, kind of getting a jump start on them isn't as a huge, big of a deal. And there's a ton of really cool varieties of squash and cucumbers out there and even okra of where if you're buying a seedling, you're maybe limited to one or two of what they've got at the store versus if you're buying a seed, you have a huge amount that you can purchase from. Um, your root vegetables, I mean, kind of makes sense. You're not really buying seedlings, even beets. You can buy seedlings or little starts of beets. You might as well start them with seeds. Um, loose leaf lettuce, flowers, stuff like that. So, um, Melissa, I wanna make sure we got enough time for everybody. So I think we might just kind of leave it there and then kind of just go where questions go. Does that seem like a good idea? Okay. Okay, we have a ton of really great questions, Jackson. So you let me know um, when you're ready to wrap things up and we'll just go until then. Um, we do have over 150 people who tuned into this program today. So I apologize in advance if we don't get to your question. But I'll kind of try to combine a few um, questions together and we can cover broader topics. Okay. Um, okay, let me scroll up here. You guys are coming up with amazing questions. Um, Jackson, is there ever a time when you would need to replace soil in a raised bed? Or if you amend it to add um, nutrients every year, will that keep it going in perpetuity? Oh, that's a great question. I need to, I. I need to make a notes of like things of where I'm like, oh, I need to make make sure I point this out while we're talking before. Um, no, really, no. I think the only time I guess you would say is like, if you have maybe like somehow a pesticide or an herbicide got really sprayed on there and you're worried about it just like long lasting in the soil, if you had like some, I guess like if you had contamination from something, 
is the only thing. But for all natural stuff, no. And okay. like, I know you see, like some people recommend for containers of doing that. No, just think about amending it and just kind of adding nutrients and kind of building up the soil as kind of a living thing. Wonderful. Um, Becky of CDC too. Okay, is there a particular depth that tomatoes need to be in a raised bed? And um, along the lines of that question, I know some people use um, other types of materials for raised beds like um, livestock tanks. Is it okay to have a raised bed that has a solid bottom or does your raised bed need to be open on the bottom with cardboard to the soil underneath? Yeah, so if you're planting in a raised bed without, like, basically, like, the cardboard we can think of as open, okay. basically, to the yeah. ground. Um, so, really, there isn't a mount. Like, so we do 10-inch boards because 10 inches is a pretty good amount for kind of planting deep enough, even if the soil below the ground, like, below the bed is compacted. That's usually good. If your container is fully sealed, I would say at least a foot, if not more. And really, once you start getting into containers, you wanna think more about volume of soil per plant. So I think for tomatoes, we have a whole class on it, but I think like five gallons of soil is like the minimum amount of soil you want per tomato plant. And that's for like cherry tomatoes are kind of a small tomato. If you're gonna grow them really big, 10 gallons might even be more. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see here. Um, as far then, as pests, oh, sorry, go ahead. I, I forgot to mention also, for if it's fully contained, you're going to want to think about, like, drain it, it doesn't drain water. So I would okay. definitely recommend putting some holes in it. If you can't do that, water very carefully. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, as far as pest control goes, have you had any um, success with like rubber snakes or fake owls or using tin pie pans as a noise maker or even fashioning some kind of lid to put on top of their bed? Um, I have seen the lid on top of beds work pretty well, actually. Um, the one thing is then it's like, it's one of those things where it's like, a, I make it as hard for the squirrels and rabbits, but then like, does it make it too hard for me as the person to get to the stuff? Um, for the noisemakers, I, we, like, I've done some, like, random things to put out there, and, like, it works for, like, a little bit, and then they just kind of get used to it. I have seen some pretty interesting kind of, like, scarecrow style where, like, the wind really makes it, like, really random looking, and so I would imagine maybe that would work, because the problem is, like, just the animals get used to it, um, and then the other question was about... What was, what was the first part? Oh, the lid. The lid. Oh yeah, the lid. Yeah, that's tough to get to is kind of the thing. Um, yeah, so I've seen people do the lid with like a chicken wire that works pretty decently. Um, but yeah, it's really like, then you're like, well, am I going to be able to like, because it's usually tomatoes and you have to prune them. And so it's like, am I going to be able to really effectively prune these tomatoes? Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see here. Can we plant spring season plants directly in the ground right now? I would wait till after Friday um, because of that weather. Like if we look at our planting calendar, yes. But I think I haven't looked at the weather. I'm actually not in St. Louis right now. So I like, can't speak perfectly to what the weather looks like. Um, but I remember like, I think it was like getting down to like 13 or 15 or something. Okay. It's gonna be cold. Then, yeah, I would wait. Um, but yes, you can plant right now, pretty much. If we kind and of we're talking, up. we're talking about like spring plants, like lettuces and broccoli and cold weather plants. But your warm weather plants, like your cucumbers, tomatoes, is it still a little too early for that? Yes. So April fifteenth is our last frost date, and really, you don't even need to be like if you notice on our gar planting calendar, like some people plant their tomatoes on April sixteenth, and it's like it's tempered like sunlight. We're still not getting a ton of sun. We're still getting more sunlight every day after the 16th, after the 15th. And like, that's more of our limiting factor for a lot of these guys. So I usually wait till May the first week, cause you don't get a ton of benefit. They're not, they're kind of just going to go on the ground and sit there. The soil's not too warm. And you're really just risking like last year, we had a late frost after the 15th. It and was so late. You're risk, it was yeah, you're, yeah. You're risking losing those plants. So yeah. 
Okay, um, let's see here. Um, does adding organic matter such as chopped leaves, wood chips, increase nitrogen in the soil? Does it make sense to plant clover or leaf clover in the garden space to add nitrogen in the soil? Yes, it does. You can also plant some legumes, so those work great. Um, the only thing is like, because those are basic, I mean like a cover crop, and I didn't really do like a definition of a cover crop, is really just any plant we're planting for feeding the soil and benefiting the soil, or like not eating it kind of thing. So yes, clover works great. I know some gardeners that like kind of plant the clover and kind of plant the things they're going to eat in between. The only thing is you have to make sure you like, you want to kill the cover crop before it turns from a cover crop into a weed. So like before it goes to seed. So like that's the only thing is you're thinking is like, am I going to be able to do this without damaging what I'm going to eat? Or maybe the stuff I'm going to eat is already going to be out of the bed, so I don't have to worry about it. Um, so okay. I think, yes, and then that adds or nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium are the kind of the three in P and K for our organic matter, what we're looking at. Thank you. Okay. One of our patrons writes, I had some really nice tomatoes from a plant that I bought. Can I start seeds from that plant and expect the same fruit this year? Pretty much, unless you bought a hybrid. So if it's not a hybrid, which usually if they're selling the tomato seeds or the plant, they'll tell you, cause like that's a selling point. Cause like what a hybrid, hybrid is a, a hybrid plant is basically the two parents are selected for usually, usually is selected one for production. So they produce really nice fruit and the other one's selected for a pest resistance. And so they've bred them together. And so the hybrid, which you'll see is like F1 is the first generation from those parents. And so what happens is it is not gonna be its offspring. So those seeds in that tomato are not gonna be consistent with that one because it's such a new plant. So it could range. It's not like it's gonna produce something that's not a tomato, but it just might be something random. But if it wasn't a hybrid, which like if it didn't say F1 on the name, it's not a hybrid, then yes, you can do the seed saving. Um, I imagine if you grew them last year though, you probably don't have any tomatoes that alive. So if either you've saved the seeds or you're planning on saving them this coming year. So, and there's tons of great tutorials. Tomatoes are pretty easy, easier than others to do some seed saving. So, and that saves you a ton of money too. Awesome. Okay, I, um, we have a couple of questions about wind plant specific um, vegetables, but I put a link to um, some tips and tricks on Seed St. Louis's website. And then also I put a link into the um, planting calendar that Jackson had pulled up that had all kinds of um, common veggies, all your mm -hmm. onions, parsley, lettuce, tomatoes, when to plant those. So um, save that, click on both of those links before we close the program and bookmark them so you have them saved after the program ends. Um, let's see. Um, one of our patrons writes, I heard mushroom soil is good for the plants. Can you recommend a good soy source for mushroom soil? Hmm. I, I mean, like, I know, like, growing mushrooms in partnership with other plants, yes. And, like, I know a lot of people that will definitely under, like, fruit trees, plants and mushrooms in kind of the mulch, which is really great. I don't know exactly what they mean by mushroom soil or, like, I guess we just kind of the stuff with mush, the soil that the mushrooms grow in, but I don't know where you would get it. So I cannot provide a good resource for that. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> um, we had a couple questions about controlling squash bugs. Jackson, what do you know about that? Yeah, I even saved. So yeah, we have a bunch of slides afterwards. <laughs> um, I apologize, I didn't change the logos. So, <laughs> um, so squash bugs are tough. So. They're one of those things. So we pretty much only do kind of like an organic approach to gardening, which means we there really isn't a great spray that can kill adult squash bugs. So best thing to do is first early in the season, look for eggs that look like this on the backside of plants of the leaves. Um, if you're like, eh, I can't tell if it looks like that. If a pass, if a if an insect is laying eggs on a leaf of something that you probably need from it's a really good chance that it's a pest that will be eating that plant. So just take your finger, rub them off. That'll really lower the population really quickly or prevent it from getting too big. Um, if you have consistent problems, usually I find the best way is just kind of picking them off early in the season, throw them in some soapy water. And then 
not using a straw mulch below the plants. So they like a cool place to go at night. And so putting that straw mulch do down really keeps them protected from like any birds or predators that they have. And then also from you from seeing them. So usually I'm like, oh, mulching's great, do all that, but take that mulch off if you have a big problem with it. So um, spraying neem oil can kill the eggs and it's kind of semi-effective on the smaller ones, but once they get full size, they've like, their exoskeletons like fully hardened or whatever, so they can't, the neem oil doesn't do anything. All right, um, let's see here. Can you give tips for people who have particularly um, some clay soil in their yard? Um, is there anything that you can amend clay soil with compost, wood chips, aeration, or is it just better to do a raised garden if you have real hard clay soil? If you have your whole, like if your whole yard is clay, I would say you probably just think about growing above it, going just above it, because it is like you're fighting against it year after year. Um, if you are going to amend it, what you would probably do is I would use kind of the broad fork system because tilling clay soil isn't really, you're not really doing anything. Um, but use the broad fork where you're kind of like loosening up the soil, creating some air pockets, just dump a ton of compost in it um, and do that kind of through the year. You could plant some cover crops and probably some grasses would do really well because they really help create some really nice, so like, um, like an annual ryegrass um, or even a perennial um, you could do, but planting those grasses and then kind of knocking them down before they go to seed and just kind of like let them die on the soil. And then you're kind of creating a mulch. But then like the thing with that technique as I'm telling this is basically you're almost creating a layer of soil above your clay. So it's like almost makes sense to kind of just start with the raised garden anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Sounds like that might be the best way. Yeah. Um, okay. Earlier you said that a big tomato plant really needs 10 gallons of dirt. Would a patron be able to stack two five gallon buckets together to make like a big 10 gallon tomato tower? Do you think that would work? One of our patrons wants to know. <laughs> Um, yeah, the one thing is like the taller you go in height and not out is the weight of that soil, I mean, is going to be compacting on top of it. Um, and it will dry out really fast if you're using a container. So it's like the only, I mean, you could do it, it'd probably be okay. But the one thing that we've done those, like if you've seen like potato towers and stuff like that, and we found every time, first you have to do really well draining soil. So it's like mostly compost, which is like a lot of work to get that much compost. And then you have to water it so much because it's like the sun's hitting it from all the sides. And so it's such a surface, such a big surface area. So it has to be constantly watered. So if you do that, then just be prepared to like kind of water it pretty often. Just make sure to stick your finger in there. If it feels dry, water it. You. Okay. Last question. Back to the clay. One of our patrons wondering, I'm, I might say this word wrong. Can you add vermiculite to break down clay? Did I say that right? Yeah, that was right. Um, I mean, it's not going to break it down because vermiculite's kind of a stagnant thing. It will, like, it is loose and it will add some little loosen up of the soil and add a little bit of a kind of a structure like that. So, I mean, like, it, it wouldn't damage anything. I just think if you have a whole yard of like some pretty heavy clay soil, it's just kind of tough. You're fighting against, like just thinking about how much you're fighting against of like that space is like really, the clay has been there. It like established, like it was created there by all the soil conditions and weather conditions. By nature. Yeah, exactly. And we're coming in and we're like, eh, we're gonna do a couple of things. And it's like, yeah, we can make some success, but it sometimes just makes sense to kind of go above it. But yes, vermiculite would probably be something like that. Um, same with just, I mean, like anything kind of loose and airy that drains well. So the vermiculite's kind of going the correct way of like compost, vermiculite. Some people like try not to recommend using like peat because it's just so bad for the environment, but like stuff like that um, is a good way to do it. If you're really stuck on like, you were gonna do it. Yeah, okay, we're gonna leave 
the questions there. I will remind everybody that this was recorded, so it will be available on the St. Louis County Library's YouTube page. But also don't forget to go to the Seed St. Louis website because they have all kinds of other great programs that are not presented in partnership with the library that you can catch, all kinds of resources, planting guides, everything that we went over and pretty much looks like is available somewhere on your alt website. So <laughs> check yep. that out. Um, it looks like it's just seedstl.org. Um, and be sure to check this out on YouTube if there's any part, any information that you want to revisit. We will be sure to send you send you a link. Um, I just put a link in the chat box again. Um, if you, it's a very long um, and awkward looking link, but that is um, the search for any garden related programming on our calendar. So we have tons of garden related programming coming up this spring. So be sure to register for a few more. And then also, if you don't mind filling out our virtual sign-in sheet before you go, um, leaving your zip code there really helps us understand who we're reaching with the programs. Um, and then also it gives you the opportunity to provide any feedback, um, tell us what you liked or didn't like, or if you have ideas for future programs that you want us to present, let us know there in the virtual sign-in sheet. We really um, appreciate everyone taking the time and giving us your feedback. We take it very seriously. All right, Jackson, we will see you next time. Thank you so much for sharing this wealth of information. Can't wait to see pictures of everybody's gardens that they get going now. Yeah. All right. See you All then right. later. Bye.